in an interconnected and rap rapidly evolving world, the plight of asylum seekers has become an increasingly urgent issue, as individuals free prosecution, violence and instability in their home countries, the question of how societies should respond to their arrival has taken center stage. This critical high-level thinking aims to advocate for a compassionate and inclusive approach towards asylum seekers, arguing that governments should accept all those who have entered the country seeking refugee. By recognizing their equal rights as human beings, we can foster a more empathetic and just society. A very good evening, I bid to Mr. Speaker, adjudicators, confounded members of the opposition, my fellow brother in arms, and last but not least, the members of this floor. We, the government, standing tall in our motion that the government should accept all asylum seekers who entered the country because they have equal rights as human beings. Before I continue with my point, let me define what does it mean by asylum seekers. An asylum seeker is a person who leaves their country of residence, enter another country and applies for asylum, which, for example, international protection in the other country. An asylum seeker is an immigrant who has been forcibly displaced and might have fled their home country because of war or other factors harming them or their family. Now, moving on to the first argument on behalf of the government, we must accept all asylum seekers as we have the obligation to uphold the international commitments. One of the primary ways in which countries upheld their international commitment is by ratifying and implementing relevant international convention on asylum seekers. In the Malaysia context, the primary convention in question is the 1951 United Nations Convention relating to the status of the refugees, UNCSR. Even though Malaysia is not a party to this convention, it is a worth considering the impact of its ratification and the potential benefits it could bring. By ratifying this UNCSR charter, Malaysia would commit to recognizing and protecting the right of refugees and asylum seekers, ensuring that they are not forcibly returned to a country where their life of freedom will be at risk. Such recognition will grant asylum seekers legal protection, access to basic services, and the right to seek employment legally in our country, thereby safeguarding their human dignity as a human being. Moreover, ratifying this convention will signify Malaysia's commitment to international solidarity and shared responsibility in addressing the global refugee crisis. Furthermore, the, questions, uh, the consequences of failing to uphold these international commitments are significant and can have an adverse effect on a country's global cooperation and credibility. If Malaysia disregard, disregard its obligation to protect these asylum seekers, it risks damaging, it risks damaging its reputation as a responsible member of an international committee. For example, Malaysia as an ASEAN country. This could hinder its ability to, eng to engage in beneficial co collaboration such as trade agreements, diplomatic relations between countries and also the developmental partnership. Failure to upheld this international commitment could create a precedent for other nations to follow suit, leading to a decline in global cooperation as a whole. In an era where migration and displacement have become global challenges, it is essential for countries to work together to find comprehensive and humane solution to help these asylum seekers who had been tortured in their original country. By refusing to fulfill its obligation, Malaysia will contribute to a breakdown in international cooperation, hindering effort to address the root causes of displacement and provide protection for vulnerable individuals. Upholding this international commitment regarding asylum seeker is essential for Malaysia to demonstrate its commitment to human rights, global cooperation and credibility. Ratifying this UNCSR would provide a framework for protecting the rights and dignity of asylum seekers and refugees, which failure to do so will undermine the country's international standing and hinder cooperative effort. To address the global refugee crisis, aligning Malaysian laws with international standards will ensure a more consistent and comprehensive approach 
to asylum seekers protection. By fulfilling its obligation, Malaysia can play active role in fostering a more just and compassionate world for everyone in this world, regardless of uh, their nationality or anything, as long as they are human being, and we have the moral obligation as, as a country where the rights and of the most vulnerable vulnerable are safeguarded. To conclude my argument, the government standing tall in our motion that the government should accept all asylum seekers who entered the country because they have equal right as a human being. Thank you. I wish it was true that countries all over the world would have the same capacity, not only to be able to accept these asylum seekers, but also to maintain them by securing their welfare needs. But the truth, it is not. Assalamu alaikum and good day, Arabic, to everyone. My name is Nur Nabila binti Adnan, acting as the first speaker of the opponent. Acting as the opponent today, we believe that the government should be given the option whether or not to accept these asylum seekers who enter into their country and this is not an infringement of human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, before I begin with my speech, I would like to respond to the speech made by the first speaker from the proposition just now, which discussed the duties of countries to uphold international commitment and accept all asylum seekers which intended to enter into their country. Members of the floor, first and foremost, it must be understood that the opposition today are not trying to deny the importance as well as the benefit from the action of accepting this asylum seeker. But rather we argue that this duty must only be imposed to the host country that have agreed to accept these asylum seekers. The first speaker from the proponent just now even agreed that Malaysia is not a country which registered under Refugee Con Convention 1951, which make Malaysia as not a host country. Due to this fact, how is it possible for the proponent to impose this duty upon our country while we are not even willing to take up this responsibility? Finish with the rebuttal, we shall proceed to my argument today. But I would like to begin by defining again on what is today's motion. To begin with, asylum seekers, according to United Nations Refugee Agency, are defined as individuals who are required to leave their country. But due to some technicalities and formalities, their application for sanctuary has yet to be approved by the authorities involved. This group of people are neither recognized by their origin law nor also according to the international law. Considering the fact that their status is not even acknowledged by the law, the opposition believe that the government owns the right to not accept this asylum seeker and this is not contrary to the human right on the basis that not all countries would have the same capacity and capability to accept as well as obtain them in their country. It is proven when an article written by Rigoberto Adel Gago titled as cause of care for asylum seeker disclose the fact that the total cost of care required in order to obtain asylum seekers and refugees varied between $1.9 million to $4.4 million. Acknowledging this fact and truth, we submit our first case which is that Malaysia is only a transit country and they should not be obliged to execute the duties of a host country. Members of the floor, host country refers to countries who have signed the Refugee Convention 1951 as an indication of their willingness to not only provide spaces in their country to these refugees and asylum seekers group, but also to ensure their welfare is protected as per the other citizens. Up until today, less than 100 of countries are registered as the host countries that are willing to receive these asylum seekers as well as the refugees. Although acting as a host country will surely provide second life chances over, over these asylum seekers, as well as showering them with thousands of benefits, as per argued by the proposition just now, have you ever wondered why there are some countries that decided to not do so? Well, a simple answer would be because volunteering as a host country is not an obligation, but rather it is an individual option that requires full commitment and preparation and also not all all countries are lucky enough to have the capacity to do so. It must be noted that as much as one country is intended to provide their services to this unprivileged group of people, they must also ensure that their action will not jeopardize the welfare of their original citizen. If they are not even able to provide their citizen with an excellent service, why should they be asked to burden themselves with additional responsibility by asking them to accept this additional citizen? Surely, this is not what justice is and this is not the main purpose of law. 
Looking at this in the context of Malaysia, we are not registered under Refugee Convention 1951, which put our position as only a transit country rather than a host country. With that being said, it can be summed up that Malaysia is not obliged to provide this asylum seeker with their necessary needs and this could demand it by them later at their host country. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the floor, embracing the fact that Malaysia is not a host country and is not bound by the rules and regulation on asylum seekers and refugees as per provided by the UNHCR, we will be looking into the position of Malaysian law and what is guided to our government on this matter. Article 9, Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution clearly stipulates that no citizen shall be banished or excluded from the Federation. Before we jump into the discussion of this article, it must be reminded first that the Federal Constitution constitution referred just now is the supreme law of the federation that does not only govern this act of the citizen but also the conduct of the government. Thus, in measuring the rationality behind the decision taken by the government, its constitutionality must be cross-referred to the article and provision in the federal constitution. Focusing back to the above article, it has been embedded in the supreme document that no citizen shall be banished or ex excluded from the federation. In simple terms, this provision provides the right to the citizen to have a freedom of movement and to have the right to ensure that they will not be expelled from their country. Although such right has been outlined by the Supreme Law, it is important to acknowledge that this right and provision is only applicable to the citizens of Malaysia and for the non-citizen, this provision will not be applied. With that being said, it means that the government of Malaysia will have the power to not only the, uh, to ask the non-citizen of Malaysia to leave the country, but also they are able to prohibit them from entering this country. And bear in mind that this right is constitutional and shall not be considered as infringement to any other law, including human rights. Due to this, it clearly explains that the act of our government denying certain entry on some group of asylum seeker is not an immoral act, but rather they are exercising the power that is allowed by the federal constitution itself. Honorable members of the House, concluding the first case from the opposition, I would like to emphasize that the government should be given the option whether or not to accept this asylum seeker who enter into their country and this, not, this is not an infringement of human rights due to the fact that Malaysia is not a host country and also our federal constitution allows our government to act so. Timothy Killer once said, freedom is not the absence of limitation and constraint, but it is finding the right ones, those that fit nature and liberate us. With that being said, we as the opposition today would like to reaffirm that we are not denying the asylum seeker from their right as a human being, and neither we want to discriminate them from other people. But we would like everyone to emphasize here is the fact that not all countries are having the same capacity and capability to do so, and by acknowledging their weakness, they should not be viewed as violating one's human right. Thank you. Put yourselves in the shoes of a Somalian refugee boy. Not only did I have to come from a war-torn country, now I'm in Malaysia, where I do not have the rights to education, I do not have the rights to legal protection, and I do not have general basic human rights. This is a world the side opposition intends on proving to you is good. Here, us on side proposition will tell you otherwise. Now, there are two burdens today. Side proposition has the burden of proving accepting refugees is better for Malaysians as well as for refugees, as well as side opposition has the burden of proving to you that not accepting refugees is better for Malaysians as well as for refugees. Now, uh, note how I mentioned two stakeholders which were not necessarily acknowledged by the opposition side. Two stakeholders today, Malaysians as well as refugees. Malaysians can be characterized as not only the government, however, Malaysian citizens themselves, and refugees are just a general term for any uh, asylum seeker who enters uh, the Malaysian waters, right? So I will be proving to you, as well as my other teammates, uh, uh, that accepting refugees will actually be better for our citizens, as well as our government, on top of uh, enabling refugee people to receive better rights. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before moving on to my point, it's important for us to contextualize how refugees look like currently in Malaysia. Uh, on top of what Ayman Elhami, my first speaker, had already mentioned, it's important for us to recognize that currently the Immigration Act is the, is the legislation in which governs uh, all refugee movement, right? But unfortunately, this 
creates an unclear stance from Malaysia, which goes into my first point, improving international relations. Malaysia's stance on refugees is simply unclear. They have not signed any form of UN conventions as well as have not signed the 1967 protocols. What does this mean? This means Malaysia is left with a lot of refugees who have no legal status to either education, work, and or protection under the law. This is bad because we have hundreds, if not thousands, of refugees who currently roam the streets, whether it's Kuala Lumpur or whether it's all the way in Perak, uh, with no access to education, with no access to legal uh, rights, as well as to no access of work. Now, why is this a bad thing? Because upon Malaysia recognizing, as well as becoming one of the signatories of the UN, uh, convention of Rights, we will actually establish credibility for the Malaysian government. Why is this true? Because currently Malaysia's image is simply bad. On top of the things I have already mentioned, a lot of individuals have realized within society itself that we do not actually recognize refugees as real human beings, considering the way we treat them is literally inferior to other citizens around us, looking at these individuals with stigmatized eyes, right? So. Currently, we have recognized that Malaysia is not one of the 149 countries who have signed. This is a bad thing because the countries who have signed are very strong countries, countries such as Turkey, countries such as Sweden, as well as countries such as France and Croatia. Why is this important, however? Because upon Malaysia fixing their credibility, we can then begin to have international backing. International backing from the 149 countries which I have previously mentioned. Countries that I would like to add are like the United Kingdom. These are countries with extremely strong belief in upholding human rights. These are countries which promote worker unions. These are countries which promote feminism. These are countries which promote human rights and nothing less, something a country like Malaysia simply fails to do. Now, what's the bad thing that has currently happened in status quo? Uh, a quote from Munira Mustafa, who is a non-resident and a writer for Newsline's Institute of Policy in Washington, DC, told Al Jazeera, refugees do not pose a danger to Malaysia at all. Uh, their access to the legal system for redress as well as lower propensity to trust authorities or police to report incidents or harm or and to seek assistance is low considering they have no trust in the government currently. This is a bad thing because criticisms like this made to uh, news stations such as Al Jazeera are made on an international stage, ladies and gentlemen. This means that malicious credibility, number one, as well as ability to afford rights to refugees is automatically in question on a national stage, an international stage, where hundreds of countries are viewing Malaysia as a country which is number one backward, a country which doesn't afford rights to their people, and a country which cannot be trusted. Assuming, however, we do in fact sign uh, these uh, UN conventions, we will be able to attain much more better uh, impacts such as a better economic trade as well as military aid considering we have established relationships with these countries. These are uh, the economic trade point will actually be touched upon by my following speaker, uh, Justin. Now allow me to respond to the rebuttals and responses given out by the first member of opposition to our point. She simply said, ladies and gentlemen, side proposition and or the Malaysian government simply has no obligation because we have not signed. So. They're proposing that just because we have not signed, we automatically do not have to treat these individuals, refugees in this instance, with any form of human rights and or rights, period. She did not provide any alternatives as to how we should be dealing with these individuals, rather just saying, oh, we have not signed, let's just let them be. We're struggling ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, here on site proposition, we have given you an alternative, which is to actually become one of the signature countries as well as to become one of the host countries. She also did not provide a mechanism as to how they will be transiting these individuals from Malaysia to other countries through a safe means. With that, side your side proposition if you want to protect the rights of human beings. Thank you. Good evening to all members of the floor. I am Nur Kairani, the second speaker from the opponent's side today. would like to rebut the second 
speaker statement which claimed that accepting all the asylum seekers who entered the country would improve international relations between Malaysia and other countries, especially the signatories of the United Nations Convention on Refugees. Being a signatory to the United Nations Convention on Refugees will indeed help in maintaining and improving the international relationship between our country and other countries. However, we should also look at the other side of the execution of the good deeds. What, if, what is the consequence that needed to be, to be faced by our own government in accepting those asylum seekers? We could highlight that the financial aspect as reported by the International Catholic Migration Commission, the, rest the resettlement of asylum seeker to the host country caused the government of the host country to provide for them, the non-citizens, financially. What if the number of the asylum seekers increases gradually as the government holds the door open for them to enter into Malaysia? The opponent believes that it would be as disadvantageous to the country as a whole and the citizens will clearly be the one who feels the suffering. Maintenance and improvement of the relationship between Malaysia and other countries can also be done by other means. For example, by sending humanitarian aid to countries that are currently facing war or natural disaster instead of accepting their people of asylum seekers here in Malaysia. Take for instance, when Malaysia has contributed RM2,000 million in humanitarian aid to help the earthquake victims in Turkey and Syria in 2023. Not enough with that. The meeting of the Prime Minister himself, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, to Syria to give moral support to the country has also strengthened the relationship between these two countries. Thus, there are other effective ways in improving the international relationship between Malaysia and other countries instead of accepting asylum seeker into being part of Malaysia and forcing the citizen to live with them. Proceeding with our stand, to strengthen our stand that government should not accept all the asylum seekers who enter into the country, we should take a deep, serious look at how the existence of asylum seekers heavily affects the safety of Malaysian citizens. This is so as they did not feel like the asylum seeker belonged to them or share the same lifestyle with them. The differences in the lifestyle led by the asylum seeker seems not fit in Malaysia as they have their own culture that they bring to practice in Malaysia. In regards to the safety of the citizen, the existence of asylum seeker in Malaysia often brings up the issues of crime, especially property crimes like house break-ins, vehicle theft and snatch theft are quite common to be committed by the immigrants. Other violent crimes like rape and murder, according to the World Bank Organization, has also shown an increase in this crime from 2003 to 2008 committed by the asylum seekers in our countries country, which is very worrying and cause fear among the victims as if they are the ones living in the alien country. Apart from that, when there are overflowing communities of asylum seekers in Malaysia who eventually need a space to live, there will be a competition in finding shelter not only um, among the asylum seekers themselves but also among the Malaysian as the right to property belong to the citizen to live in and make life out of it. It is snatched away by the asylum seeker. According to United Nations Human, there are about one, there are about 14,765 asylum seeker applications by refugees received in Malaysia in 2021, where, which were dominantly by Myanmar, Pakistan, Afghanistan and 3,365 decisions related to the application were made resulting in around 99% of the application being answered positively. This means that only 1% of the application were written down by us. The issue here is, despite the generosity and kindness shown by the government, are there any side effects to the livelihood of our citizens? Do they live in peaceful and comfortable space? Do they even have shelter to protect them in our country? Sadly, the consequence to the acceptance of the asylum seeker to our own country, shelter becomes limited and it is hard to, for Malaysia to even 
live in a harmony and a safe environment as they need to compete to have such basic necessities. This situation is very contradictory to the right of citizens of Malaysia over a safe livelihood as enshrined in Article 5 of the Federal Constitution, which states that no one shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except in accordance with the law. Having a comfortable and a safe house as a shelter to protect the citizen from harm to, to any human being or animals or even the weather is not even con in contrast with the law of Malaysia. To conclude my argument, in order to ensure the citizens are not hindered from accruing their rights, the asylum, asylum seeker should not be accepted by our country as their existence will not only cause harm and burden to the citizen of this country in order to run and seek help from the other countries, they did not only come without the legal permit but also stole away the necessities that should have been the citizen's right. Our own citizen has then become stranded in our own country due to the asylum seekers' existence. Thank you. Good evening everyone, I'm Jasdeep Singh and I will be the third speaker for the government. To start off, we will respond to the opposition's point on asylum uh, seekers being expensive. Early on, it will cost money, but this is a short one to two year period, where after that, they would, be, they would become tax paying workers who would be working and paying money back to the government through um, work and service tax. This means more money for a side, proposition in the long run. Second about crime, the current crime, crimes exist because they have no rights. They do crime because they have no money, they, the, their standard of education is low, and of course, this will lead them to commit more crimes. In our world, when they start to adapt with us, they will be given jobs and a proper education that will solve any social problems such as crimes, unlike the proposition. To start off my point, as the proposal of this motion, I stand before you today to advocate for the admission of all asylum seekers who have entered our nation. I believe that these individuals should be treated with the same rights and dignity as any other human being. I will focus mostly on two primary arguments to support our position as the government, which are the economic and cultural benefits that result from allowing asylum speakers, seekers into the country. In addition, in order to bolster our argument, I will, ref I will refer to applicable laws from our country itself. Firstly, about economic benefits. When people talk about asylum seekers, one of the key worries that is frequently brought up is the potential strain that it would put on the economy. However, studies, re studies and real-world evidence have demonstrated time and again that welcoming asylum seekers can, in fact, have a positive effect on a country's economy. To begin, variety contributes to both cultural and social advancements of a society. When we welcome those who are seeking refuge, we are inviting people from a variety of diverse experiences and backgrounds, which adds to a rich tapestry of different cultures and points of view. Our society's social cohesion, tolerance, and understanding are all strengthened because of the rich cultural diversity that we have. It enables us to gain knowledge from one another and to develop as a nation as a whole. And as you know, Malaysia is home to people of a diverse range of ethnicities and cultures. We believe that welcoming asylum seekers is consistent with our commitment to in inclusion and cohes cohesiveness. Asylum seekers have the potential to make positive contributions to the labor as well as the economy. A significant number of these people are in possession of useful skills and qualifications which enable them to fill labor shortfalls in a variety of industries. We tap into their potential and increase economic output by giving them opportunities to work and contribute to the community. Asylum speakers have the potential to contribute fresh skills, ideas, and an entrepreneurial spirit to Malaysia, all of which could be beneficial to the country's economy. It is important to note that our nation has a solid legal framework to regulate employment. This framework ensures that our citizens and those asylum seekers or non-citizens alike are for the equal treatment and protection from discrimination. This is in, in accordance with the Immigration Act of 1959 amended in 1963 of Malaysia, in which Section 6.1 grants the Ministry, Minister of Home Affairs 
the authority to grant permission to any individual to enter or remain in Malaysia for any length of time they think appropriate. This section illustrates the government's right to exercise discretion in determining whether or not to admit asylum speakers on the basis of humanitarian reasons, irrespective of the status under which the individuals are entering the country. In addition, the Malaysia Refugee Information Service, or MIRIS, was founded by the Immigration Department of Malaysia in order to provide and provide support and help to refugees. This is another example of our dedication to defending human rights. Our second point as the government is regarding the cultural benefits. It is possible to develop cultural interaction and mutual understanding by accepting asylum speakers, which will ultimately result in a society that is more inclusive and dynamic. We broaden our understanding of other people's norms, practices, and points of view when we make, our, make room in our community for people from all walks of life. Through a number of different pieces of legislation, the government, has, government of Malaysia has acknowledged the significance of preserving the rights of refu refugees and people seeking asylum in the country. The United Nations Convention relating to the statutes of refugees from 1951, to which Malaysia is a signatory, serves as the basis for Malaysia's commitment to offering shelter to people who are escaping prosecution. In addition, it is against the law according to the non refoulement tenant, which is a key tenant of international refugee law, to forcibly return people to their home countries if such countries pose a threat to their safety. The fact that Malaysia continues to follow these principles reflect the country's commitment to defending and advancing human rights. To conclude, it, it is absolutely necessary for the government to accept any and all asylum seekers who have entered the country as these individuals are, at the end of the day, human beings and deserve the same rights as everyone else. The economic gains that arise from their contributions to the labor and economy together with cultural richness that they give significantly outweigh any perceived constraints. This is especially true when considering the fact that their efforts have a positive impact. We can improve our society, generate more understanding, and at the end of the day, make greater strides towards progress if we embrace reality. Let us put ourselves on the side of history that is going to turn out well and help those who are in need. Thank you. Thank you, Member of the Proposition. I'm Nur Fatimi, the third member of opposition today. To respond to the third point just now, the opposition believe that actually asylum seeker do not give academic and cultural benefits to our country as being said by the proposition. It is due to the fact that the presence of academic seeker in our country currently contributes very little in touch due to the fact that they are working illegally. In terms of the contribution, we infer that no refugees currently pay direct tax given that those who are working are doing so illegally. Plus, the level of direct tax, tax paid by them will be determined by their income and consumption to the economy. We can go into the survey by the Malaysian Human Rights Commission, SWAKAM, found that of the refugees and asylum seekers survey, 26% earn less than 500 per month, whilst 58% earn between 500 to 1,000 ringgit per month. Here we could see that they only get below minimum wages and as they are working illegally, they have no entitlement to the minimum wage and no profit and profit. This, as they get the income illegally, their wages do not contribute to the tax of our country and give no benefits to our economy. We also believe that the culture integration between asylum seeker and Malaysian locals can be hindered by both language barriers and differences in social norms and practices. Language barriers play a significant role in creating effective communication and understanding between individuals from different cultural backgrounds. When asylum seekers and locals do not share a common language, it becomes a challenging to establish meaningful connection and to engage in open dialogue. So this will affect the issue of miscommunication and misunderstanding, making it difficult to build cultural gaps and good relationship based on mutual understanding between the asylum seeker and also Malaysians. As to the language barriers, differences in social norms and practices can, really, can create challenges in cultural integration. It is due to each culture has its own set of social norms, customs and values, which shape people's behavior and also interaction. When asylum seekers bring their own cultural practices to Malaysia, 
flashes with local norms may occur. These differences in social expectation can lead to misunderstanding, conflict, and a sense of cultural dissonance between the SMS speaker and the local. Furthermore, this can also impact the process of cultural integration um, and hinder the development of mutual understanding and acceptance. As we can see the issue that happened in Malacca in January 2023, the number of refugees and asylum seekers reaching thousands of people began to cause discomfort to the local population, especially related to social, hygiene, and also security issues. Moving on to the third point, point of argument by the opposition, we also believe that the government should not accept asylum seekers to the country because of the welfare rights of Malaysians will encroach on the rights of the Malaysians. It must be noted that Malaysia is a country with a relatively high population density, particularly in urban areas, which are facing some challenges related to the population growth and its impact on resources and infrastructure. As to this, Malaysia has experienced significant population growth over the years and the population stood at around 32 million people in 2020. While the rate of population growth has slowed in recent years, currently Malaysia still poses challenges in terms of providing adequate resources and services to meet the needs of the growing population. For example, urban areas in Malaysia, particularly in the Klang Valley, uh, have witnessed rapid urbanization and population concentration. Hence, it has led to increased pressure on infrastructure, housing, transportation, and public services in these areas. In accommodating a growing population in urban areas, it has led to the increased demand for housing and also infrastructure. Even the Malaysians themselves are struggling to survive the high demand and limited facilities to live in this country. And it comes to the question of why the Malaysians need to share those rights with asylum seekers that entered into our country. Furthermore, Malaysia also has been experiencing a shortage of medical power as a significant brain range of highly skilled doctors and healthcare professionals. Many of them seek better opportunities and working conditions abroad, resulting in a shortage of experienced medical personnel within the country. So the issues of doctors and healthcare workers led to one out of five doctors undergoing training in Malaysia quitting each year, reflecting an alarming dropout rate. So this resulted in the challenges faced by the medical field that can also impact public health initiatives such as the quality of care provided by doctors and healthcare workers. When healthcare professionals are overworked or inexperienced due to shortage, it can impact the trialness and effectiveness of medical treatment and services. Hence, we believe that if the government accepts the accident seeker to enter into Malaysia, it will lead to a big problem with the population and rights of the Malaysian to get the limited facilities, particularly on accommodation and medical rights in which they need to share with the asylum seeker as well and resulted in encroaching the rights of the Malaysian citizen. To conclude my argument, the opposition tends to disagree with the motion that the government should accept all asylum seekers who entered the country because they have equal right as human beings, as we believe that asylum seekers did not give academic, economic and cultural benefits but encroach on the welfare rights of Malaysians due to the Article 9 of Federal Constitution that acknowledges the right for only the citizen to be prohibited in management and excluded from the Federation. This will remain with our stand that the government should not accept all asylum seekers who enter that country only because they have equal rights of human beings. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening to all of you. My name is Muhammad Irfan Aiman bin Ahmad Soimi and I am a fourth speaker from the government team today. In response to the third point by the opposition team, the opposition team cannot cherry pick the situation of urban area to say that Malaysia has high rate of population, therefore the refugees should not be allowed to enter our country. It is because every urban area in every country would experience the same thing. One worthy question that should be asked is, could we solve the demand in labor force with the population that we had right now? Absolutely not. The demand of human labor force, clearly a big priority in the agriculture and also industrial sector, especially in rural and village area. One of the factors is the Malaysians tend to leave labor job as it is heavy, tiring, and the given wage is very low. 
Looking at the reality, as on 13 March 2023, Ministry of Human Resources of Malaysia reportedly have an MOU, which is Memorandum of Understanding, with more than 10 countries, including Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Cambodia, whereby the government of Malaysia would bring some of the workers from that country to sustain the high demand in human labor of our country. Move to the first point of government team today. Around the world, the refugees are asylum seekers which have been forced to flee from their war-torn homeland, while some whose home country was struck by a natural disaster. They travel far away from home to a foreign nation in hope for more proper shelter and more peaceful life. But the irony is, those who has escaped into Malaysia now situated in a very vulnerable position, wherein they are susceptible to arrests that would be made by immigration officer due to, to their status of illegal immigrant, and they also became subject to exploitation by employer. With that, our first point is in preserving the basic right of refugees. We strongly believe that government of Malaysia should accept all asylum seekers who uh, enter our country as they're entitled to basic right of human being. The first point is the grant of asylum would recognize the legal status of the refugee, therefore guarantee them the protection from an arrest by immigrant officer. In the past, various forms of assistance were offered by Malaysian government in their pursuit of better protection for the refugees. One of them would be the collaboration with UNHCR. And with that, uh, the refugee will be given UNHCR identity card. And we could say, however, this card in reality have no legal effect because it is just an identity card. They do not hold any legal status in our country. It is could not serve as legally impossible entry permit or passport in our country. This was affirmed by Ministry of Home Affairs of Malaysia uh, in one of the newspaper report when they refer to the UN has Shi'ar uh, Rohingya immigrant by announcing that non recognition of their status as a uh, legal refugee in our country. For this, it is clear that while working without legitimate permit and just having UNHCR card, they are uh, uh, exposed to the very big risk of an arrest by an immigrant officer. One of the cases that could illustrate uh, uh, the more proper situation is Ton Naeo versus public prosecutor, where the applicant, which is one of the asylum seekers from Myanmar, was arrested by doing nothing wrong. He just carried out his work by selling and rep repairing computer in one of the shops. At high court, the decision is he has been in imprisonment for 10 days and after the period of imprisonment uh, has lapsed, the court ordered that this person to be uh, settled into another country. With that also, we could illustrate that the right of refugee cannot be protected. The second point is refugee and asylum seekers are entitled to equal protection of employment law in the event of employment related dispute. Historically, many ruthless uh, business person would take advantage of vulnerability of refugee by paying them below uh, the minimum wage of our country, perhaps even less than one, 1,000. They are well aware that they employ their employees is the re refugee and therefore cannot seek legal recourse. And with that, the exploitation uh, will happen. One of the case also, case Ali Saleh Khalaf against Taj Mahal Hotel, whereby the claimant, uh, one of the 
UN has CR uh, card holder working in the hotel has been unlawfully dismissed by his boss and the court decision in this case is that uh, Malaysia does not recognize the right of refugee to have right to work but looking into the provision despite, uh, despite his uh, status of refugee he had right to file a claim against the hotel by virtue of section 20 of employment act not only that uh, section 2 of industrial uh, relation act 1963 uh, was interpreted widely enough to encompass a refugee article 5 of federal constitution can be also interpreted to include right to seek and engage in lawful gainful employment another article in federal constitution is article 8 where the word use is person not a citizen mean anyone uh, have right guarantee under our constitution and it include any person that have document like UN has she are to be a legal worker in our country with that several hidden and potential hardship actually exist for the refugee because the expensive legal representation uh, representation fee are really one of the factor and the other factor is they are exposed to the risk of deportation during the commencements of the lawsuit and when their employer realized this they will terminate their employee work permit with that we could also realize that not every refugee are lucky enough to be represented before the court and more than one than just one person will be exposed to the risk of unjustful and unlawful dis dismissal with that we encourage the parliament to rectify uh, many treaties and law to bestow legal status upon refugee locally to empower them to enter into legally enforceable employment or business contract therefore we certainly believe that government of malaysia should accept uh, all asylum seeker and with that the preservation of basic right of all human being can be uphold thank you thank you to the last speaker of the government side my name is Nur Akila as the as the last speaker for the opponent side to begin with the last argument, we still stand with the government should not accept all asylum seekers who entered the country as to say that they have equal rights as human beings. The proposition has mentioned that there are some sort of violation in basic rights when the asylum seekers do not get an asylum. However, we strongly believe that Malaysian citizens' basic rights like welfare are a priority over other people such as asylum seekers. It can be seen when the local population's human rights are violated by the excessive flood of asylum seekers. The massive arrival of them can be seen in the recorded data. The total number of new arri arrival has considerably decreased since 2013 up until the present, according to statistics collected from refugees, with 28,434 new asylum seekers entering in 2013. The number of new entrants reached a peak. Later years, numbers have decreased. The latest arrivals entering the nation are not included in UNHCR figures. The figures do not indicate if those persons have just arrived. They only indicate how many people uh, UNHCR may register. And approximately 178,710 refugees and asylum seekers were registered with UNHCR in Malaysia as of the end of January 2021. This also applies to four decades refugees in Malaysia. The Rohingya ethics group comprises the majority all of refugees in Malaysia. The remaining refugees came from a variety of nations, including Pakistan, Yemen, Syria, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Sri Lanka. The proposition also said that due a grant of an asylum, it supposedly would recognize the legal status of the refugees, therefore guarantees them deportation from an arrest by immigrant officers. 
Notwithstanding that, many of them came to Malaysia illegally and legally but did not renew their permits to enter. We wanted to make it more clear with a proof when there were detention of almost 9,200 illegal immigrants in 2021. From early 2021 until July 8, a total 9,241 9, undocumented um, immigrants were detained and 30,127 persons were deported by the Immigration Department of Malaysia countrywide. Director General of Immigration Kairo Zaini Dawit claimed that during the detention, 2011 operations involved the questioning of 53,195 people. In addition, 63 foreign employees, including 14 each for Indonesia and Bangladesh and 35 Myanmaris were held in Operation Pato at a foreign workers' public at a construction site in Yara Park, Sungai Petani Kedah. It was determined that everyone who was arrested had committed an offence under both Section 6 Clause 1 and Section 15 Clause 1 of the Immigration Act 1959 and 1963 which were mentioned as unlawful entry in Malaysia. Due to the affirmation issue, the Malaysian government has their right to not accept them as per argued that they have equal rights as human beings. Article 9 Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution mentioned that no citizen shall be banished or excluded from the Federation. Pursuant to the article, the Malaysian government has a right to not allow asylum seekers who are not classified as Malaysian citizens to the country yet or may be expelled from the country as the number of them in Malaysia grows gradually. This action cannot be said uh, as a cruel action from the Malaysian side, but this is all for the welfare of the local people themselves who of course need to be well looked after other than outsiders. In response to the last part of arguments by the proposition, refugees and asylum seekers are entitled to the equal protection of employment laws in the event of employment-related disputes, which cannot be agreed by us today. Considering that the influx on arrival of asylum seekers to some extent has deprived the rights of local residents in the employment or economic sector. Asylum seekers from foreign countries have affected the economy of the local population in Malaysia. This is because they monopolize the work of local residents such as construction labor. Competition in the employment sector now causes many Asian graduates or local residents to compete with asylum seekers or foreign workers who are willing to accept a high workload even with low wages. The influx of asylum seekers causes employment opportunities for the local community to be blocked. This is because the cost of employing foreign workers is cheaper than local workers. This implication affects local economic growth where the young or skilled workers in the country are oppressed simply because companies prefer to use foreign workers over local workers. The government here should think of policies that have reduced the unemployment rate of the people which is increasing day by day. Formulation of policies that support the well-being of the people will surely get solid support and be able to increase the spirit of love for the country among the community. Indirectly, the community will live and work in the country and nourish the country's economy in a healthy way. In support of what has been mentioned before, one of the results of the monopoly by asylum seekers or foreigners, local residents fail to, to get job opportunities at construction sites in Cameron Highlands, which are mostly occupied by or asli. This situation has resulted in the dumping of skilled and unskilled workers in the construction sector with an estimated 1,000 people unemployed. Employers choose foreigners to save an operating cost. They don't have to pay employee contributions and insurance, but instead deny the right of local people, especially or as to get jobs in their place of origin. Employers recycle foreign workers from one project to another until the group of foreigners resides in the Cameron Highland area for many years. To sum up, we from the opposition stick with our stance with the government should not accept all asylum seekers who enter the country because they have equal rights as human beings. As per argued in an initial, Malaysia is only a transit country in which there is no obligation to fully protect their human rights. Their arrival affects the safety of the Malaysian citizens when crime cases rise and shelter becomes limited for locality. 
Then the asal seekers do not give economic and cultural benefits to us, but create an encroachment on local human rights. And lastly, the job opportunity become limited to the Malaysian citizens when they enter into our country. Thank you.